Hey, Steve. Um, I know when we were talking about cytoplasmic male sterility, talking about um, sort of factors that can reverse the sterility, um, are those interacting with nuclear DNA or are they just acting within the mitochondria themselves or the, uh, whatever? Or um, they seem to act in the mitochondria and they're the ones that are known. There's a big family of genes that seem to act. I forgot, they, I think that they're um, RNA editing genes. So basically what they're doing is a lot of the male sterility genes seem to arise by, um, plant mitochondria are weird, they're large and they recombine a lot. They have a lot of repeats. And there's been evidence of new male sterility genes arising um, through recombinants that make new open reading frame, a new protein. And then the uh, restorers will um, basically manipulate the transcripts. So there are, they're messing with the RNA coming off of these new open reading frames, if you follow all that. Yeah. Um, and and the, so the restorers come from a very big family of RNA editing genes often, probably not all of them. There's probably other, there's, I mean, it's such a widespread phenomenon. There's probably other things that go on, but this is, you know, this is known to be a significant aspect. Okay, cool. I didn't know it was. Yeah, no, it's pretty interesting. Um, what the interesting question is, is how does it, be, it's tissue specific, right? So it only happens in, mm -hmm. in tissue associated with producing pollen. Because if the restorers were um, messing with the mitochondria in all tissues, then the plant might not be a very good plant. Mm -hmm. So they're often um, sort of fighting it out over in the in the uh, the mitochondrial expression of male sterility is a, usually a tissue-specific degradation. I'm wondering if some of the ABC genes for um, plant flower development are. Uh possibly contain factors that affect those RNA. Uh, yeah, that could be, because it's certainly, you know, obviously it's expressed in the, in the flowers. And so um, the, one, the one example that I remember of the specific mechanism is if you know, then when pollen is produced, uh, there's a layer of tissue that surrounds the pollen called the tapetum. And that has very rich in mitochondria. And in petunia, they've shown that at least one of the male sterile genes the um, tapetum deteriorates, the mitochondria um, sort of deteriorate, and the tapetal tissue deteriorates. And so there isn't a, an energy supply for microsporogenesis. And so, but there's, there's many other mechanisms. You can, if you just look at the phenotypes, the morphology, you can often see the abortion of the stamens in different stages. So, it isn't that that's always the mechanism, but it's interesting that that's a well-defined example. Okay, before we start, any any questions? So we're talking about um, mitochondria. We have uniparental inheritance mostly, and so that creates a sex-biased selective filter on deleterious mutations. Those Mutations that are deleterious in males can potentially rise to high frequency because there's no selection against them because the males are not transmitting the mitochondria in any case. And so the theory suggests there could be an association between mitochondria and male disease. We then talked about the fact that, um, you know, that's a nice theory, but what happens in mitochondria that's male specific? And the most striking prediction would be um, deleterious sperm performance, right? But there could also be effects in other tissues. Neural tissue is particularly sensitive to mitochondrial defects, although it's not clear how you'd get a male bias. Um, then there's some other follow-on issues we'll talk about, but that's sort of where we were. So before we go on, though, let's make sure. Um, although the idea is very simple, it's not uncommon I've given, you know, talked about this a lot, where people just have a little bit of a hard time kind of getting their head around the, the whole story. So if you have a question, feel free to ask it. Um, I've had fairly experienced biologists, they just couldn't quite get how mitochondria could 
be deleterious in males and that could not be selected against. Um, Would you say that like um, methylation and epigenetic factors are what allow it to be deleterious in males but not in females or uh, think that the, the deleterious alleles act on sex chromosomes? I'm not sure how um, it deleterious specifically in well, that's a good question. We don't really have a lot of knowledge of this. What the general view of the, of the reason why sperm would be sensitive to a potential um, mutant effect, but females would not be affected, is the argument that <clears throat> uh, mitochondrion, that's 90% of normal performance. Um, if a female has such a mitochondrion, it would be probably would have no phenotypic consequence and probably have no phenotypic consequence in most yep. in almost all male tissues but in the sperm it would probably reduce swimming performance by 10 percent or so which would probably have a huge effect on fertility okay so that's the simplest thing but i'll give you another example later that's uh, neural tissue disease that's male specific and i i don't know um, that anybody knows why. I haven't looked in the literature in the last couple of years, so it could be that somebody's figured it out, but it, it just happens and we don't know why. Now, the, you, you could just say, suppose that some mutations have male-specific effects and some mutations have female-specific effects, because it's not that it's biased. There's just some mutations that are one way and some mutations that are the other, for whatever reason. Um, the ones that are deleterious in females will just disappear from the population. The ones that are deleterious in males may be retained. So that's what the filtering idea you have to have in mind. It isn't that mutations are biased one way or the other. It's the filtering process. But it's a good question. Mechanistically, um, there's there's now quite a bit of evidence that, that this happens, but there's very little information about mechanism. So that's definitely a big open question. And I think that, like a lot of things in biology, until people can identify what's really going on, it's always going to be a little bit mysterious and a lot of people will find somewhat unconvincing. Um, but, but the evidence for it is pretty widespread. Other questions? Okay, so then the argument was I made was that um, there could be an association between mitochondrial effects and male infertility. And another pu a true puzzle to me um, is that male infertility is, is a surprisingly common trait, both in humans and in Drosophila and other organisms. And you would think if, you know, it, of all traits, that fertility, both male and female fertility, would be traits under the very strongest selective pressure and traits for which you would not expect to be a relatively appreciable frequency of, of defective performance. But actually, male sterility, you know, it's hard to get an estimate in human populations, but the numbers that people say are somewhere between up to 5% and sometimes as high as 15% of males are either infertile or have significant fertility problems. Um, now, again, from a point of view of natural selection, that's sort of shocking because we usually think of a fitness effect of one part in a thousand, you know, one tenth of one percent is more than big enough to have a, an effect on evolution, an evolutionary consequence. So you start talking about several percent, that's a huge effect. Um, but anyway, so we published this idea about male infertility um, as one possible example of the idea. And a few years later, somebody did a study where they went in populations and they looked at um, groups of males that were infertile and they looked at their mitochondrial genotypes and they discovered some mitochondrial genotypes that were correlated with infertility. And so they started doing the genetics on these things and they found the the phenotypic effect that this mitochondrial defect in these males, which was associated with male infertility, and I'll show you time for a picture here. Let's see. 
We need to show you a picture. So this is just a general picture. Let me get my pointer. This is a picture of oxidative phosphorylation, the electron transport chain in the mitochondrion, right? So there's the mitochondrial membrane in the background. These are the cytochromes that have to do with electron transport. And this is ATP synthase, which makes ATP. And you know, if you don't remember anything about respiration and, and metabolism, basically um, the vast majority of your capture of free energy from food happens when the when you have a little electron transport process across this membrane with these particular molecules playing a key role. And it happens in the mitochondrion and in eukaryotes. Um, actually, bacteria are similar. They have the same basic setup, but they don't have a mitochondrion. And they do this on the inner membrane. So it's the same. But in mitochondria, it looks like this. And so basically, there's this electron transport process, which isn't that important to us. But what's important is that in, in humans, I believe this is for humans, um, I think there's only 13 mitochondrial genes. So the mitochondria have their own genome, but they have a very small number of genes, something on the order of 13 or so, plus or minus a few. So it's a very small number of genes. And most of these genes play a role in this electron transport. They encode parts of these cytochromes. And these cytochromes are these big, complicated molecules which have many subunits. And here, the subunits that are shaded in a very light color, they're encoded in the nucleus. They're nuclear genes. And the proteins are then exported to the mitochondrion. Okay, So these genes are actually encoded by the nucleus. But the Gene, the subunits, the protein subunits, the components, they're in these bright colors. These are encoded by the, cyto the um, mitochondrial genes, these bright colors. And they then assemble as components of these complex molecules, which have many different parts. And so when this study of, of male infertility was done, and they found the genes, I believe it was cytochrome C oxidase. And it was one of these genes. I don't remember which one, probably two, but I don't remember which one, um, COX-2, that um, was defective, that had a, a defective performance. And that makes, if you think about it, that according to the theory, that has to be true because the nuclear encoded genes are transmitted through both the male and female line. And so a nuclear encoded gene, which is deleterious, is going to affect both male fitness and female fitness equally because it's encoded by the nucleus. But for the genes in the mitochondrion, if one of those are deleterious, that's only going to have an evolutionary consequence in the female line. Males that carry one of these deleterious mutations, they're not going to transmit the mutation anyway. So the phenotypic effect in males has no effect. And so it turned out that these, these um, Males had a, and both and the females, and you know that would carry this mitochondrion would have a def, somewhat defective cytochrome oxidase C, but it only reduced um, performance by a little bit. And they actually demonstrated that the males that carried this mutation had reduced sperm swimming performance, and that that was associated with the reduction was correlated with the reduction in male fertility. And um, I don't know that they looked at females who carried this mutation, but um, I believe that, you know, that, that they would find that there's no evidence that this mutation has any significant effect on female fitness, but it's causing a significant degradation in male fertility, if not complete infertility. And so you see mechanistically, here's a very good example of what's going on. And so that was a, proof of principle, I like to think of it. It shows that the idea, the prediction was borne out and the idea could work in principle and it does happen in natural populations, but it doesn't tell us how common this is. Maybe this is extremely rare. Maybe there's just you know a few mitochondria that have this particular situation and it's a 
explains almost none of male infertility or other male diseases, or maybe it's very widespread. We don't really know. So this is, again, I say it's a proof of principle. It shows that the, the logic is consistent with the observations here of what we see. So that was published um, in about 2000, that study on male infertility a long time ago. And, um, you know, there were other studies done, but I think that one of the most interesting studies was done um, about four years ago or five years ago now. And this was a study in the laboratory. It was a different, different study now. It was done in the laboratory. And the idea was to take flies in the, uh, Drosophila flies in the laboratory and look for, for new mutants that seem to be increasing in frequency that affect male fertility. And then to look at what's going on with those mutations to try to pick up in real time a mutation that's spreading and increasing in frequency in males that's associated with male male fertility reduction. So they they grew up Drosophila in these cages where there were large populations of Drosophila, and they grew them up in a particular breeding scheme to make it so that they could really pick up the effects here. And this is going to be important for the key conclusions of this study. So this was done in 2016. So the males here have little dots on their butts and the females don't. And so you would cross a male and a female and they would have babies. And then you would exclude the males from the study after that. They would just discard the males. And you would take the females that came from this cross and you would cross them to new males that came from some original stock that was not part of the line you were studying. So you've got a separate stock of males over here and you're crossing those males in, then you do the cross between one of these new males that come from this stock and the female that came from this cross, and you keep on doing that for multiple generations. And the key then is that, that all you're really doing is keeping a very pure female lineage, and the males are just basically allowing the females to reproduce to make more females. And this is important because it prevents any nuclear genes which could compensate for deleterious effects in males. So if you think about it, suppose there's a mutation that's deleterious in males. It causes male infertility and it's in a mitochondrion. If there's a nuclear gene that can compensate for that deleterious mitochondrion and restore male fertility, that nuclear gene will be favored because the males transmit their nuclear genes. So imagine a male that has a deleterious mitochondrion and would be infertile. And then imagine a nuclear gene in that male which can compensate for the deleterious mitochondrion and restore male fertility. That nuclear gene is going to be strongly positively favored and will increase in frequency. So that's one of the key predictions and one of the most important points of this whole story is that we expect nuclear compensation of deleterious effects in males. So we expect very strong interactions between deleterious mitochondria and compensatory nuclear genomes. This study design takes away the nuclear compensation from the males by bringing in fresh males from a separate stock in every generation and discarding the males that are produced from the crosses. So that this is a pure match line. And so they did this, and then what they picked up was in some of these lines, they did 12 of these lines. In some of these lines, they, they picked up some increase in male infertility happening. And so they looked at what was going on because that was potentially a candidate for a mitochondrial defect because the male infertility gene would be selectively neutral under this kind of a design. And so that's enough for the picture. Let's see. To do that. OK, we're back. So that's the study design. And so they picked up in observations of, of mutations that were rising in frequency that were causing male infertility. And so then they looked at those mutations. And they were mutations in, maybe I should have kept the picture up. They were mutations in the cytochrome oxidase C gene, which is the gene I showed you previously. And remember that there's some components of cytochrome oxidase C, which are nuclear and some which are mitochondrial. And it was, in fact, the mitochondrial gene of cytochrome oxidase C, which was associated with male infertility. 
and the sperm were defective in these males. And because this is a Drosophila and they were doing this in the lab, they could look at the fitness effects of this mutant mitochondrial gene on other components of male fitness. And there were no detectable effects in other components of male fitness. And in females, this mutation seemed to have no detectable effects on fitness. Okay. Again, in the laboratory, you can make pretty good measures of fitness. And they couldn't pick up any effects. So this is a perfect match to the theory. A mutation that reduces male fitness and has a particular effect on sperm, but has no other consequences for male or female fertility, is increasing in frequency in the lab because it's selectively neutral. And so that's consistent with the basic theory. And then they looked at this mutation in different nuclear backgrounds, and they found some nuclear genetic backgrounds that could restore sperm, for, sperm function and, and male fertility. And that's consistent with the idea that nuclear genes can compensate for the deleterious mitochondrial effects. Now, mechanistically, it's not entirely clear what that compensation is, but you know, remember that these genes are involved in a multi-subunit um, component of very complex molecules, and some of the genes are in the mitochondria, and some of the genes are encoded in the nucleus. So it's possible that the compensation is some of the other subunits in oxidative cytochrome C. It's also possible that they could be having to do with the membrane configuration and so on. There's a variety of possibilities. But the important point is that there's nuclear compensation was observed in this study. And so that's consistent with them with the broad conceptual view that there will be strong nuclear mitochondrial interactions over fitness. And that's that's really the key, one of the key points, because one of the reasons for talking about this topic goes back to my argument that there's a lot of really weird things about biology, which you're not going to get from engineering views of, of how organisms are put together. This argument says that you're going to get deleterious genes and mitochondria becoming fairly common, just inevitably, that affect males. And that you're going to expect strong compensation from nuclear genes that can compensate for those deleterious mutant effects in males. And so we expect a lot of mitochondrial nuclear um, epistasis is the technical term, but basically interaction, both mechanistically and in terms of population genetics. So when we do crosses and we take mitochondria from one population and we put them into the nuclear background of a different population, we might expect incompatibilities to arise. And so this is one of the interesting consequences that is one of those subtleties of biology that I really like to emphasize so much, that you have to understand the weirdness of biology to understand a lot. And this, this could have very, I mean, it's a very strong effect potentially on the, on the structure of genomes and the interaction of genetic effects and the um, ways in which different mechanisms evolve for interactions between genes that doesn't just have to do with efficiency. It has to do with compensation for weirdness, basically. So um, that's that study. I have a couple more studies just to round things out, but I'll, I'll pause briefly um, to pick up any questions here. OK. Oh, uh, yeah. just had a, I just had like a, a naive question. Um, are there species where the parts of where the entire electron transport chain, the entire oxfos chain is put is relegated to the nucleus or would that just be too inefficient or something? Um, only in bacteria. <laughs> got it. Yeah, because if you've got a mitoc... Now, I, I mean, I take that back. There's maybe there's some weird um, either very primitive so to speak you carry out like things that have some other um, membrane structure basically anything with a mitochondrion i believe everything with a mitochondrion has some mitochondrial components involved maybe that's a simple answer to your question there could be some other weird variants that are either um, degenerative um, or other things. You know, in biology, you, you don't want to ever say that it doesn't happen um, because there's often weird 
weird species that do strange things. Yeah. Okay. Others? So let's. So I'll, I'll just mention a couple more studies. Um, there's been a huge number of studies, and I'm picking out some of the ones that I think are more interesting. Um, among the large number of studies, um, many of them find effects, but not all studies are going to have reported um, that they found effects of these mitochondrial male, bi male biased phenomena. So I don't want to give you the impression that everybody who's looked for it has found it, but I do want to give you the impression that a lot of people who have looked for it have found effects of this sort, which is pretty amazing um, because it's not always so easy to pick up empirically. And so the next study was an interesting one. This group um, wanted to ask the question, um, okay, so the theory is very strong about male infertility or male specific effects on fertility. But also conceptually, there's no reason to think that, that the argument has to be confined to fertility effects. It could work on any phenotype. And so they wondered, can we pick up effects on other fitness consequences? And so they, wanted, they decided to look at aging, that is senescence. And so they worked in Drosophila and male Drosophila tend to age more rapidly than female Drosophila do. And so they say, okay, there's a sex bias in aging. Is any of that sex bias in aging explained by um, this mitochondrial sex bias selective filter, deleterious effects on male aging from the mitochondria that have little effect on females could increase in frequency. Maybe that's why males have a, you know, excess aging. And so they wanted to do that study and they wanted to do it in natural populations to pick up what's going on. But they recognize that it's very hard to do a study in natural populations because there would be nuclear compensation. So if there's a deleterious mitochondrion that affects male, that causes a reduction in male fitness in a population, you would expect there to be pretty strong nuclear compensation. And so if you just look in one population, you might have a hard time seeing anything. So they recognize that they would have to look at crosses between populations. And so they came up with the following fairly clever design. They got a common nuclear background, which in Drosophila you can do, you can order it up from a company, you know, give me a particular background. And so they have a nuclear background that they're gonna use for all of their crosses. And then they went across the world and they got from 13 different populations, very spatially isolated from different parts of the world. They isolated some Drosophila and they brought the Drosophila back in the lab and then they started doing crossings in ways that could bring the mitochondrial from the populations that were isolated from the field and try to isolate those mitochondria as purely as they could onto the common nuclear background. And you can do that by repeated crossings. And so basically what you do is you isolate the, the mitochondria and bring it onto this common nuclear background. And so now you can see the effects of the different mitochondria from the different populations and how they might differ. And their prediction was because remember the nature of the theory isn't that a particular population would be will carry a deleterious effect because these because the mitochondria mutations in males are neutral they have no fitness consequence whereas in females they have a fitness consequence so the prediction is that the 13 mitochondria would have more variable effects on male aging than on female aging you understand that that there is no selection on male fitness effects. So male fitness effects, there's no selection, so there's just gonna be a random effect. Deleterious could increase in frequency, it could decrease in frequency. Beneficial for males could increase or decrease. It's just gonna fluctuate. For females, advantageous will increase, disadvantageous will decrease, right? So the males are fluctuating Male effects are fluctuating, so they should just be more variable. So that was the prediction. And that's actually what they saw, was that the male effects of the mitochondria um, on aging were more variable than the effects of the mitochondria on female aging. They also found that when they did pairwise amino acid substitution distances between the mitochondria, you get a notion of genetic distance. 
that there was a correlation between the more diverged the mitochondria were genetically and the more diverged they were with regard to their effects on male aging. So that's kind of consistent story. Now, one of the criticisms of this study is, well, there's just one nuclear background. And so that's not necessarily wrong, but it really limits your inference here. So just recently, and in fact, this study hasn't been published yet, but I had a chance to see it. Somebody did basically the same kind of study design, but they crossed nine lineages. Um, they have nine, they isolated nine lineages that they use for mitochondrial donors, and they have nine nuclear backgrounds. So they have 81 different combinations, and they formed those 81 combinations, and they also found the same basic um, outcome, which is that the male, um, that the mitochondria have a more variable effect on males. In this case, the phenotype they used was wing size. And they used wing size because wing size is correlated with body size. And body size is known to be dependent on respiratory efficiency, mitochondrial performance. So wing size is a proxy for respiratory efficiency. And they so again, this basically confirms the study, but now looking at a much broader set. And in the original experimental design, a subsequent study just looked at a respiration rate. And they found that um, the mitochondria have more variable effects on male respiration rate than on female respiration rate. So all of these things are pointing to a consistency. Um, these are just broadly consistent. So they're, on the one hand, they're very interesting. On the other hand, they're not, you know, sort of like really nailing it down very strongly. But it really, again, shows that there's potentially a pretty broad effect. Uh -huh. Again, these are natural population studies. And doing these kinds of things in the laboratory and picking up effects is not easy. So the fact that they could see things in the lab, I think, means that there's a fairly significant phenomenon going on. Um, so I just have one more study to tell you about, but I'll pause briefly in case you want to pick up a question. Okay, so the last study is about a disease that's known as Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy. And this was a disease we actually talked about in our original article. This is a disease that's known to be in, um, transmitted by mitochondrial mutations. It's known to have a very, very, very strong male bias. It's quite rare in females. And so what happens is that males carrying this a defective mitochondrion have a fairly significant probability of early onset blindness, which is a severe phenotype with a big fitness effect. Female carriers, extremely rare that they show any deleterious effects. Now, not all male carriers express disease, which so it's unknown what the, you know, what the reason is for that, but it's not uncommon to have a variable expressiveness or technically the word is penetrance for a mutation. So you can get a bunch of carriers and the penetrance might be, you know, 5, 10, 20, 30 percent. That's not uncommon for, for genetic inherited disease, whether it's the genetic background or whether it's just luck or environment, we don't know. Um, but so this is a, a disease that was known. And because it was known to be a mitochondrial inherited and male biased, you know, we, we originally thought that this might be a good candidate for the idea. And a, a few years ago, someone did an extensive study in Quebec, Canada, where they found all the cases of this disease that they could find in the entire province. And they did the genomics on these individuals. And they um, also have very good marriage, marriage and birth and death records in the province. So they could correlate individuals with their genomics and trace back their pedigree. And they found that 89% of the current cases Male, these are male carriers of the of mitochondrial disease, trace their mitochondrial ancestry back to a single mother who married in the year 1669. So that's 350 years ago. And that that one mother is the, and her mitochondrion is the progenitor of all of these current male carriers, 89% of the current cases, and all of the carriers in this large pedigree. And they had the birth and death records and the marriage records, 
And so they could trace the history, and since it's maternally inherited, they could trace the records and they could actually figure out the fitnesses of all of the individuals because they know how many children, at least to the degree to which you could do this with some records, but the records are not bad. You know, they're, they're obviously not perfect, but they're not bad. And they could trace then the reproductive success of male and female carriers all the way back. And they found that the male, males who carry this um, mutation had a 35% reduction in fitness, which is huge in biology. I mean, you know, again, 1% would be, would be a big effect. So a 35% reduction, which for early onset blindness is not surprising. Um, again, not all male carriers will express the disease, but enough of them do that they had that severe effect. And there was no detectable effect on the, really on the females. In fact, they, they thought that maybe there was a slight positive effect, which could explain why the mitochondria might be increasing in frequency. But, but that slight effect was so slight that I, I'm inclined to say that there's no real strong evidence that it was different from zero. It's pretty small. Basically, it was neutral in females. And so you get a real match then, once again, to the concepts here. Um, seemingly neutral in females, strongly deleterious in males, and yet it seems to be spreading and rising to a high frequency. And that's consistent with it just being a random process where you're just getting, um, you know, just by chance, it could potentially increase in frequency. Or if it's beneficial in females, then that would really explain the, the mutation is beneficial in females, then that would really explain the frequency. Um, but if it was beneficial in females, it might be even more common, right? There's no reason why it wouldn't just spread, become very common. Um, and interestingly, the, you know, the, I don't know of any evidence for nuclear compensation for this disease, um, but there might be some that might explain the variable penetrance. So it's hard to say. So those are, um, and then there's again, many new examples, but I think that's more than enough to give you a sense of it. And again, the whole point of talking about this is to get your mind around um, when you're thinking about genetics, clinical genetics, if you're, interested in human health, or you're just interested in any phenotype of an organism that's fairly demanding in terms of um, energetics, which many traits are, um, that you need to think about these weird sort of things, and that you need to think about the genetic structure of populations in this very strong cytonuclear interaction. There's been a few studies published in the last several years that really show um, potential for pretty strong mitochondrial nuclear interactions over fitness, and that maybe incompatibilities with crosses between different populations would be a significant phenomenon. Because within any population, you're getting a drift effect on males, which requires compensation for the local population. This would be very local to the particular population. Different populations are going to drift in different ways. They'll have different nuclear compensation. So crosses between populations would be particularly susceptible to exposing the deleterious effects of the mitochondrion. Okay. So that really says a lot potentially about the genetic architecture of diseases and of populations. So a big consequence. Then the um, last issue that I like to always talk about here is say, okay, I gave you some diseases so what other diseases might be good candidates to look at? Suppose you just got a big grant and you could study any aspect of this problem that you wanted and you're interested in clinical human health questions. And you say, okay, we're interested in seeing how widespread this phenomenon is for other diseases. You know, what other problems might you look at? What might you choose to look at? That's a question. There's always cancer, I believe. Yeah, cancer is male biased. So actually, human cancers are male biased. And um, that's certainly, you know, anything that shows a significant male bias without any obvious reason why there should be a male biased effect is a candidate. Um, and some cancers are more male biased than others. 
and I'm not just talking about, you know, obviously reproductive tissue diseases are sex biased, but colon cancers happen more in males and so on. So there's many, um, many male biases there. So that's one possibility. What other diseases, what's a major disease which is, has a significant male bias? What's the biggest cause of death in humans? Heart disease. Yeah, heart disease. It's male bias significantly. Mm. Mitochondria, well, respiration, res respiratory performance, mitochondrial defects. It's actually known that mitochondrial defects affect heart disease. As far as I know, no one's really ever followed up on the idea. So we've got mitochondria are known to affect heart disease. You've got a strong male bias. It's, you know, it's there. You have a clinic that, that, that looks at a lot of um, heart disease cases. It would be easy. Mitochondrial genomics is easy. Mitochondrial genomes are small. You can do big samples. You've got a clinical samples, huge clinical samples are possible. You could do sampling of the base population in a particular region where um, you know, the people come from that are presenting with heart disease and um, look at males and females. One of the things that fascinates me about that is you could look at people who are the outcome of crosses between parents from, from genetically diverged populations. These would be particular candidates for express, expressing the deleterious effects of mitochondria because you'd have a mitochondria from the mother in a nuclear background from a father from a different population. So you might lack the compensatory effects that might be common within a population. So the greater the genetic divergence, potentially the stronger the consequence. It's a kind of a speculative prediction. It's a pretty wild prediction. But on the other hand, it's very logical and simple. And there's more than enough circumstantial evidence to say that it could happen. And it would, again, it would be, I think, pretty easy to do that kind of a study. I mean, doing the genetics on people now, it's, you know, it's, you can, you can mail off your own genome off to 23andMe and get your own genome back, right? So if you, you know, it's not that hard. Um, but I, I, you know, I don't know of anybody who's doing that yet. Um, it could be, but I don't know of the studies. Another, oh, you got your 20. <laughs> there you go. And um, yeah, there we go. And uh, the same thing for male infertility. So there's clinics in, in you know, big clinics in large cities um, of, of quite a large population of males will present in the clinic with male infertility. And it would seem to me like a great opportunity to do the genomics on the males, do the genomics on the base population from which those males are coming from, look at the their mothers and fathers to see if they're, you know, how genetically diverged were the mothers and fathers. Again, the strong prediction is that males who are an outcome of a, you know, widely diverged cross will on average potentially have greater, um, will have a greater potential for showing mitochondrial um, based defects of one form or another. Those are just statistical predictions. Of course, we're looking for broad correlations and you know, any individual is going to isn't going to necessarily match up to that. But just in terms of broad clinical correlations across populations, it would be interesting to look at. Um, but I don't really know if anybody's doing that. And the last example, which I find kind of interesting, is that starting a few years ago, people developed the technology to um, compensate. So females occasionally carry mitochondrial defects, and they want to have children. And so they would like to have children, but they would like to have children without their mitochondrial defect. And so people develop the following technique, and this is doable. You can take the egg from the mother and remove the cytoplasm in the mitochondria and take the sperm from the father that doesn't contribute, does, does not contribute mitochondria, and then have a third parent that's the mitochondrial donor. So these are called three parent babies. Mother's nuclear genome, father's nuclear genome, and a third parent's mitochondrion. Is there a reason why they wouldn't take the father's mitochondria? You know, I don't know. I was I, I took a quick look and I didn't I didn't have time to follow up because I had I just wondered a bit. But I think that um, 
it may be that it's easier to take the mitochondria and, and make this work because you're maybe extracting the mitochondria from a mother's egg, from a from another egg. Oh, okay. And that would be competent mitochondria, whereas trying to get the mitochondria out of the males um, is never in the right form for putting into an egg. Okay. And it would just be, um, you know, it, why invest in all the, you know, the technical thing? I mean, normally the normally the father wouldn't be contributing the mitochondria anyway. Sure. So that would be an abnormal thing, but it might be, you know, you might want it, but that's, um, I don't know a lot about that, but that's, that's all I know. But this, and this has actually been approved. So if you live in the United Kingdom, in the UK, you can have this done. And it was interesting because a whole bunch of people who work in this field, not me, but other people, um, wrote some articles saying, well, you know, you're taking a mitochondrion and you're moving it into a novel nuclear background. That is exactly the kind of situation that you might get into trouble. You might want to look at that before you approve this for clinical use. Um, but they went ahead with the clinical um, clinical approval. But there's still a number. Of, another article just came out. I think I put it on the OneNote page yesterday. If you're interested, another article just came out arguing that this is really um, calls for caution because. There's a lot of evidence in other species that there's mitochondrial defects um, that arise by this process that we've talked about today and that there's nuclear compensation for these mitochondrial defects and strong mitonuclear interactions. And this is a method that specifically takes a mitochondria and puts it into a novel nuclear background that you at least need to think about this. Um, so far, there's been on the one side scientists who are kind of interested in the saying this and then the Clinical geneticists are seem to be unimpressed. Um, I don't know much more about it than that, but it's kind of an interesting ongoing topic. It hasn't been resolved. There's not much data, um, but I suspect you know at some point there'll be enough cases, and eventually some data will build up, um, and maybe we'll see something about that. So a couple of minutes for questions. And the very last comment, which is the, the way I first got interested in this was I was actually working on the, the bacterial symbionts that live in insects. So many insects um, have bacteria that live in their guts that help them with digestion, particularly insects that have very narrow diets like blood feeders, like bed bugs um, have them, mosquitoes, many insects. They have sap suckers, insects that suck on sap, very narrow diets. Um, they often will have these symbionts that provide essential nutrients. And the symbionts are typically been transmitted from the mother um, into the eggs and onto the progeny. And so the males will often have the symbionts, but they don't transmit them. So I was interested in this. and But there's some cases where it looks like the males might transmit the symbionts. And so I was recognizing that there were different transmission pathways for the symbionts. And I was becoming interested in um, how the symbionts might be influencing their host's phenotypes. And I recognized that a symbiont, that even if a male depends on the symbiont for its own feeding, that there could never be selection on the bacterial symbiont for its consequences on male fitness, because the males weren't transmitting it. But in some species, the males seem to transmit the symbiont, so that wouldn't be true. So you could possibly look at a comparative study depending on the mode of transmission. And I was thinking about that for a while, and then all of a sudden I realized, well, I mean, that's just, my, you know, what about mitochondria, which is exactly the same situation. And it was, um, I thought, well, you know, that's such an obvious idea. There must be a big literature on that. And the strange thing was that there was no literature on it, which was sort of surprising. And, and to this date, there's not much literature. I, I still think that the insect problem is, is in many ways biologically more interesting because there's a lot more diversity in the nature of the symbionts, the patterns of transmission, and so on. And um, it would be possible because they're insects and bacteria, you could do all sorts of fairly good controlled studies. But 
Um, I don't know that anybody's ever picked that up. In fact, I'm, maybe it's my fault. I never actually published on the symbionts. I just published on the mitochondria. So there's, there's a paper waiting to be written on that still. But I think it's a good topic. And then the whole problem of insect symbionts has actually exploded in recent years to become a huge topic unto itself. Um, and so actually it would be a timely thing to follow up on. So, is, yeah, go ahead. Yes, quick. Is there a, are, is the relationship between insects and these bacteria symbionts the same thing as uh, humans and microbiomes um, or no? Well, yes and no. Um, the symbionts of the, of some of the insects have fairly um, rigid pathways of transmission and movement in the body. And yeah, and whereas I don't know that there's any adaptations of humans for transmitting their microbiome to their progeny and that the microbiome, some of these symbionts are really matrilineally transmitted pretty strictly with some leakage, you know, because of course you can get pick up bacteria from the environment. So the degree to which they're only transmitted from mother to offspring or, to, or which there's some horizontal transmission varies. I think most of the microbiome is probably, of course, the mother has a strong effect. So there's a matrilineal component, but there's also a huge amount of picking up from the environment. Um, so there's similarities. Yeah. So sure. I used to, I used to study this. Um, and you actually do get like vertical transfer. First of all, when you're born, you can get it through like yeah. her fecal matter. And then from, depending on how you're born, like vaginally, you'll get her uh, vaginal microbiome. Yes. Well, if it's like C-section, you'll get her C-section microbiome. And then as you're like breastfeeding, you'll get her like breast milk microbiome. Yes. Um, yeah. But what happens by the time you're your age? How much of your mother's microbiome do you still have preferentially? Well, I don't, I mean, I don't live with my mom anymore. Um, exactly. <laughs> and she's 3,000 miles away. So, um, but yeah, you do right. see like in adults, like if you actually sample their microbiomes, we compare it to their parents, you do see a genetic, um, like a relation between genetics. So I'm more similar to my mom than a stranger is to my mom's microbiome. But is that because of your nuclear genome or is that because of your history of exposure to your mother. In other words, if your mother also had a, you know, did a cross fostering for someone yeah, who was if genetically it was like different. Adoption, yeah. So you're saying, let's say she adopted a baby as well as I was a baby and we were born like, and we were raised together. Yeah. I would still be, my microbiome would still be more similar. Okay. Well, that's, that's very interesting. So there is a maternal component because I had a friend who did a study a long time ago, um, and he looked at E. coli in, the, in his dog and in his family and in his neighbor's dog and his neighbor's family. And they were all pretty much, they were all, for E. coli, for the strains he could look at, they were, they were all the same. So it was pretty much dog, family, neighbor, you know, they were all, they were all one, one basic genome. But of course, now we know that the microbiome is, this was a long time ago. So, so that's very interesting. So that says that there's both, um, matrilineal and and horizontal transmission playing a role. And so that would be, um, that would raise some really interesting questions then about the selective pressures involved, especially if there's a different, if there's a difference between the particular bacteria that are matri that tend to be matrilineally transmitted and those that tend to be picked up horizontally, then there could be some real differences in the nature of the co-adaptation of host and, and microbial species. So um, that's really interesting. And I think in the insects that it's also the same thing that there's some species are more strongly matrilineally transmitted and some are more picked up horizontally. So you see a range of things. So um, that diversity would be really interesting to look at. Adding Anyways. to what Seth, oh, sorry. Oh, let me just say, if you have to go, of course you're free to go, but then, I'll, we'll, we'll, then we'll follow up on questions for anybody who wants to stay. Go ahead. I was just going to say, adding to what Stephanie said, a paper uh, a couple of years ago found that they were actual gut microbes in the breast milk of breastfeeding mothers. But when they like looked at natural, like the skin microbiome, like these were not common microbes. 
Um, and so there's hypotheses about during, um, like, birth and in that time about gut microbes actually traveling to be essentially packaged into breast milk. But, you know, mm -hmm. mothers aren't constantly going septic, so they don't know how that's moving. Um, but there are, like, mechanisms about, like, intentional maternal transfer of microbes. Oh, that's incredible, because actually what I was studying at the time many years ago was I was very interested. The insects have many mechanisms for getting the getting the bacteria back into their eggs, right? Because these, these are bacteria that are functioning in the gut, and the insects often have special structures in their guts to to store and use the bacteria for metabolic reasons. But then the question is, which bacteria are getting into the eggs? Because, of course, from a bacterial fitness point of view, you have a germ soma separation, which was actually my point, right? You can have some of the bacteria that are in the, ov that are in the ovaries, and those are the ones being transmitted, and some of the bacteria that are in the gut that aren't being transmitted. And that's a separation between germline and soma between the bacterial population. And so in this case, um, the bacteria that travel into the mother's milk, since that's the mode of transmission, are potentially functioning as like the germ lineage for the bacterial population that's transmitted. Whereas bacteria that might be not in the locations that would allow them to get into this packaging are effectively evolutionary dead ends. And so they're like somatic bacteria. Um, and so you get that's a, you know, kind of a weird idea. In insects, you can really see that as a potential. Um, but the idea that there could be something like that in humans is, is incredible. I never thought about it. Um, if you think of it, it would be great if you could, if there is an article and you know of it, if you posted that, I would love to see it. Um, yeah. Fascinating. It's great.